thanks everybody for coming and welcome to the bullet time bullet points <laughs> bullet points lunchtime webinar series on firearm injury prevention for clinicians. I'm Amy Barnhorst and I'm going to be moderating today's session. We're really excited to have Brian Barks here to talk about voluntary self prohibition laws and how they hold promise for preventing firearm suicide. Uh, first, I want to start with a few announcements. Don't forget to mark your calendars for the third Thursday of every month at noon Pacific for just a half hour um, webinar where you can sit and eat lunch and listen and learn about firearm injury prevention. Our next webinar will be August 16th and it's going to be with Robin Kogan, who's a nationally certified school nurse in the Camden City School District. And she's the New Jersey director for the National Association of School Nurses. She's going to talk about the impact of firearm violence and threats on student health. We also have a poll at the beginning and the end of every webinar. They're very short, and these help us understand where our audience is coming from, what they know, and what you all learn from our webinars. So we're going to launch our opening poll for everyone to go through right now. It will be very quick, and then we will close the poll after about a minute, and I'll introduce our panelists. Okay, um, while we're wrapping that up, thanks everyone for filling it out, and without further delay, I will introduce Brian Barks. She is a writer and editor specializing in mental health communications. Brian holds a master's of health sciences and mental health from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her graduate work focused on firearm suicide prevention, specifically healthcare providers role in the implementation of voluntary self prohibition laws. She's currently working with faculty at Johns Hopkins to conduct a survey evaluating clinicians use and awareness of these laws in Virginia. And before attending graduate school, she served as Director of Strategic Communications at the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence, where she worked for six years. Her work, which often incorporates her lived experience with mental illness, has been published in the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, Vox, and The Hill, among other publications. She also recently wrote a blog post for bullet points leading up to today's webinar on voluntary self-prohibition, the suicide prevention tool I wish my doctors could offer me. So please take a look at our blog on the website if you haven't had a chance yet. And thank you so much for being here, Brian. I'm going to let you uh, unmute yourself and take it away from here. Thank you so much, Amy. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. I'm going to be talking about voluntary self-prohibition as a tool to prevent firearm suicide. And again, my name is Brian Barks. So voluntary self-prohibition is a relatively new firearm suicide prevention policy. What it does is it allows individuals to voluntarily sign up for a no buy list for firearms, which prevents them from buying guns from a licensed dealer. So it's essentially someone saying, I know I'm prone to suicidality and I don't wanna have access to guns in the future. So I wanna put myself on this list to prevent myself from buying guns. The policy was developed by Fred Vars, who is a law professor with lived experience at the University of Alabama. It first went into effect in Washington state in 2019, and then was followed by Utah and Virginia in 2021. So those are the only three states where it's law currently. But excitingly, there was a federal bill introduced last week, HR 8361, and I'll talk a little bit about that bill a bit later. Uh, there is a process to remove a name from the list once you are on the list, but there's a waiting period in each state and in the federal bill as a safeguard against impulsivity. I want to caution that there are limited data um, on this policy as these laws are so new, but more research is underway. So this presentation is not going to be a super data heavy presentation. I'll be sharing my lived experience, a theoretical overview of the policy, mechanisms of the law, and the existing evidence that we do have. So the rationale for the law is really twofold. The first uh, reason for having this law is addressing the capability for suicide by limiting firearms access. And we know that this is really important because access to firearms is a strong risk factor for suicide, and having a gun in the home increases the risk of suicide substantially. Evidence shows that the risk of mean substitution is low, meaning that most people have a preferred method of suicide. And if that method is made more difficult to access or taken away entirely, they're less likely to substitute with another method. And if they do substitute, uh, the lethality is likely to be lower than it would be for a firearm. Recent gun purchasers appear to be especially vulnerable to suicide, which is relevant because of the target population for voluntary self-prohibition, which I'll talk about in, in subsequent slides. 
The second reason that this law is important is that it gives individuals agency. Voluntary self-prohibition acts as a type of advanced directive, and it recognizes that at times individuals may lack the judgment to make decisions that optimize their health and well-being. A lot of people, especially people with mental illness and serious mental illness, can talk about the unwell version of themselves and the well version of themselves, and they may use different language to describe this. But basically, the unwell version of themselves wants something completely different than the well version of themselves. And this law allows individuals to preempt crises when they are well by reducing their own access to firearms so that they don't make an irreversible decision when they're unwell. So my interest in voluntary self-prohibition stems largely from my own lived experience with mental illness. I have bipolar type one. I was diagnosed at age 19. I was actually diagnosed with bipolar type two at age 19 and later diagnosed with bipolar type one. But even before I was diagnosed and throughout the course of my treatment, I have struggled mightily with suicidal thoughts and behaviors during, during mood episodes, especially depressive episodes and especially during mixed episodes. I've tried a variety of treatments and treatment settings to manage my symptoms, including inpatient treatment, outpatient treatment, and ECT. And during an especially turbulent year a few years ago, when I was first learning about voluntary self-prohibition, I was hospitalized four times. And during that year, when I was really in and out of the hospital and in and out of being sick and being well for really brief periods of time, I was really terrified of what I might do to harm myself when I was sick. So I wanted a tool to protect myself. And I was talking with Fred Vars and this is where voluntary self-prohibition really comes in. So you might not have expected to see some poetry in a presentation like this, but uh, here is a, po a quote by Louise Gluck, who's a beautiful poet. Death cannot harm me more than you have harmed me, my beloved life. And I include this because the image that you're seeing right now is my handwriting, uh, a quote that I wrote down at the very beginning of one of my hospital stays where I stayed in the hospital for several weeks. And at that time, I couldn't really read anything long form. Um, my mind just wasn't capable of processing it. So what I could really read was poetry. And my husband would bring me books of poetry to the hospital and I would copy down lines and stanzas that really resonated with me. And as you can see from this stanza, this is a beautiful stanza, but it is very depressive. And this is how I was feeling at the time. And this is what was resonating with me at the time. And then there's this quote, I can scarcely wait till tomorrow when a new life begins for me as it does each day, as it does each day. That's Stanley Kunitz. And this is my handwriting also from the same hospital stay, but just a day or two before discharge. Um, and you can see how my perspective and what was resonating with me has really shifted from a very depressive and unwell state to a mo much more hopeful state. And this is what I consider my well state where I have hope for each day that comes. And hope is a really important part of recovery for me. And I think of voluntary self-prohibition as a very hopeful intervention. I think of it as something I call a daylight solution or a daylight intervention. And daylight interventions are those that I can choose for myself when I'm stable, euthymic, thinking clearly. These interventions give me hope, agency, and practical protection against the unwell version of myself. And some examples include initiating safety planning during periods of stability. So saying to my psychiatrist, saying to my therapist, I know I'm doing well right now, but I really wanna have a plan in place for in case things go south. Um, storing lethal means safety, even when I'm well. Locking up my medication. Um, I do, do not have a gun for reasons that I have already articulated, but if I did have a gun, that would mean storing firearms safely psychiatric advanced directives, and voluntary self-prohibition if it exists in the state where you are. So C.R. Snyder is a psychologist 
psychologist who did a lot of work on hope theory in the 90s and 2000s. And I think his hope theory from this paper published in 2002 really applies very well to voluntary self-prohibition. So the first, he defines hope theory into, he, he breaks it into three buckets. And the first bucket is goals. So one kind of goal is the approach goal, which is more traditional. It's like, I wanna train to run a marathon. But another kind of goal is preventing a negative outcome or event. And an example of that could be preventing death by suicide, which for someone who hasn't experienced chronic suicidality or who doesn't have a mental illness that involves suicidality, that might seem like a really morbid goal. Um, but for someone like me, who has experienced suicidality throughout my entire adult life, preventing death by suicide is probably the most important goal in my life right now. Um, and that goes for even when I'm well. Um, so the second bucket pathways is how you reach your goals, your chosen route. And an example of that is limiting access to legal means. And then there's agency, which I've talked about a little bit. And that's your ability to use your pathways to meet your chosen goals. So an example of that that applies to voluntary self-prohibition is signing up for voluntary self-prohibition, preventing yourself from buying a gun. That limits access to lethal means and hopefully it, uh, it makes you work towards your ultimate goal of preventing death by suicide. So voluntary self-prohibition as an advanced directive. Um, voluntary self-prohibition is meant to be initiated as a protective measure and is meant to be initiated during periods of well-being, as I've mentioned. This is not a good crisis tool. It's meant to be in place before a crisis. And I'll talk about an alternative a little bit later um, for a crisis. The target population is people who recognize their own risk for suicide and do not already own firearms. We do have evidence that those who already own firearms are less likely to sign up for this. So we're really looking at people who would be making their first firearm purchase and we wanna head off that first firearm purchase because we know that people who recently purchased guns are at higher risk for suicide as I mentioned in a previous slide. So another thing to uh, note is that while individuals who live with mental illness are an important target population, Individuals do not have to have a diagnosed mental illness to sign up. Anyone can sign up. The process when an individual decides, decides to sign up at state level is pretty straightforward. They voluntarily sign up by mail or in person, depending on the state. The form and their photo ID are processed by a state agency. And then they're entered into the federal background check system next. And it works a little bit differently in each state. As you can see, this is a table that details the sign up process, the uh, removing your name from the list and the surrender process. So in Utah, the sign up process, you take a completed form to any law enforcement agency and you have to do it in person. Washington state, you also take a completed form in person to a county clerk's office. And in Virginia, Virginia is the only state of these three that has a mail in option. You submit the form to the state police. You can do it in person or by mail. The removal process in Utah, after 180 days, removal from the list is automatic, and you cannot be removed until 30 days have passed since your name was entered, which is that safeguard against impulsivity. In Virginia, you can submit it in person or by mail, and the removal will be processed after 21 days. And then Washington State, uh, at least seven days have to pass at before you request removal. Surrender is really the most important of these three categories because in Utah and in Washington state, purchase only is prohibited. So when you sign up for the voluntary no buy list, you are only prohibited from purchasing new firearms. It is, there's no pro prohibition on possession. In Virginia, purchase and possession are prohibited, but there is no formal relinquishment mechanism, which is part of the reason why this tool is a great tool in some cases, but it's not a great crisis tool because you're not removing existing firearms from someone who might be a threat. And then this is a brief overview of the federal bill. Um, this bill 
was just introduced last week, so I am by no means an expert on it, although I'm happy to try to answer as many questions as I can. Um, it is a bipartisan bill. I should also mention that this is all subject to change as, as it does. Um, this is a bipartisan bill sponsored by Representative Jayapal and Representative Curtis. Jayapal is from Washington State, Representative Curtis is from Utah, both states where this law exists at the state level. The Attorney General will maintain an internet-based database separate from the Instant Criminal Background Check database. And sign up can be in person or via mail. And then this is an interesting uh, part of the federal bill. An individual can list five email addresses to be notified upon attempted purchase or requested removal. So you could list your partner, your spouse, a friend. If you had permission from your healthcare provider to list them, uh, you could. And if you attempted to purchase or remove yourself from the list. I'm sorry for the background noise, I'm next to a window. Um, if you attempted to purchase or remove yourself from the list, those people would be notified and could potentially intervene. So removal from the list, like Virginia's law, takes effect 21 days after the request is received for the federal bill. And healthcare providers, I'm talking now at the state level because this is where we have these laws in effect. Healthcare providers are key players in the implementation of these laws. We know a significant proportion of people who attempt suicide have contact with their providers in the weeks, months, or year preceding their attempt. And for cases in which there is not an imminent risk of harm to self, but there is a history of suicidal ideation and or behavior, this could be an appropriate recommendation. Like I said, it's not an appropriate recommendation for a crisis, but if there is that history, it could be. So as Amy mentioned, I wrote a blog about settings in which voluntary self-prohibition could be offered by a clinician. Uh, these are, this is a more comprehensive list, but I, if you want to check out that blog that I wrote, I go into a little bit more detail. Um, here are eight, voluntarily admitting to a psychiatric unit, discharging from an inpatient unit. We know that's a particularly dangerous time discharging from PHP or IOP, when safety planning with your treatment team, I think that voluntary self-prohibition could be a really nice complement to lethal means safety counseling, in clinician-led support group settings, filling out intake paperwork for a new outpatient provider. Anytime there's paperwork, there's an opportunity to offer this as an option, um, or at least give information about it. When calling a warm line or non-crisis line, and then during routine depression screening with a primary care provider. I really want to emphasize this because there is no prohibition on possession in two of the three states where voluntary self-prohibition is law. And in the third state, Virginia, there's no relinquishment mechanism. Red flag laws, also known as extreme risk laws, are a better tool to use in a crisis. If such a law exists in your state, Red flag laws are better suited to remove guns from someone who poses an imminent risk to self or others. Voluntary self-prohibition is meant to preempt crises, not respond to them. So we do have evidence that many psychiatric patients are willing to use voluntary self-prohibition, which is really encouraging. One study found that 46% of inpatients and outpatients in Alabama were willing to sign up for a voluntary no-buy list. It's reasonable to hypothesize that in a state with lower gun ownership rates and a less strong gun cult culture than Alabama, that number might be even higher. Uh, additionally, in a general internet survey found that 31% of those surveyed said they would sign up. This is not the right tool for everyone, but for a certain patient, it could work really well. And then some key characteristics of a willing patient. So this is from a case report that uh, I'm working on that's in progress. I interviewed an individual who signed up for voluntary self-prohibition, and I noted these three things. The first is the presence of an episodic illness or recurrent suicidal thoughts or behaviors. That's kind of the, the behavior that we're trying to target. The second is high levels of insight into one's own condition. You can't sign up voluntarily for a no buy list if you don't have insight into the fact that these suicidal thoughts and behaviors are a problem and want to do something about it. And the third is existing understanding that firearms in the home increase the risk of suicide. 
And then I'll add on to that kind of what I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, existing firearm ownership in general makes someone less likely to sign up for this list. So I think if, if I were to add something here, it would be no previous gun ownership. Some challenges that providers might face. We know from the research that providers often feel uncomfortable discussing firearms with their patients, and they may continue to feel uncomfortable discussing firearms with their patients, frankly. Um, they may not want to offer voluntary self-prohibition as an option because it opens up an uncomfortable conversation. Hope that's not the case, but that could be a challenge. Um, the patient for whom this is an appropriate intervention may not be commonly encountered in clinical settings. Those three key characteristics that I just mentioned, they may not all align very often. So uh, this may not be appropriate as often as we'd hoped. And then providers may find that patients are not actually as receptive to voluntary self-prohibition in practice. And psychiatric advanced directives are an example of a practice that people say they want to employ. And then when it comes down to it, they're not as interested. So some questions still to explore. Um, we wanna know how voluntary self-prohibition interacts with extreme risk laws or red flag laws. I'm happy to be involved in the research that's in progress on this. Uh, gun violence prevention advocates have worked really hard to get extreme risk laws passed in states across the country. They work, they're saving lives, they're evidence-based. We wanna make sure that voluntary self-prohibition is a complement to those laws and does not conflict. And then we wanna know whether people will sign up as they learn about the law, whether clinicians will suggest the policy and the situations in which it was intended to be used. I also am happy to be involved in that research and whether the law is effective at preventing people from purchasing guns. I think as the data kind of comes in on these laws, we'll have answers to a lot of these questions in the next couple of years. And I'll pause here because these are some resources that you might want to write down, take a screenshot of. Um, the Utah, Virginia, and Washington sign up form are all linked here, as well as info on HR 8361, the federal bill at the bottom. And then for those wanting a deeper dive, Fred Vars and Ian Ayers, uh, Fred Vars being the, the person who uh, really has spearheaded this bill wrote weapon of choice, and it goes into great detail about voluntary self-prohibition. So if you want more information, that's a great resource. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Brian. That was really uh, interesting and informative. And we have some great questions actually for you. So um, the first one is, does this prevent the purchase of both handguns and long guns? Yes, it does. Okay, great. Um, and do you know what the consequence is if sellers bypass this list? Like, is it, and it's, I'll just add to that, this is my own question. Is this um, a list that they would have to check only during uh, sales through an FFL or would this have, they would private party people have to check it? No, so this is only to, uh, sales through a licensed dealer. Um, the consequence, I anticipated this question and I consulted with Fred Vars um, about the consequences for trying to bypass the list. And, and what we kind of were discussing was that we don't, because the laws are so new, we don't have a lot of anecdotal evidence about this, but uh, we expect that the consequences would be that they wouldn't be able to purchase the firearm and there wouldn't really be legal consequences for trying to purchase a firearm. Um, that's at least the answer that we decided upon. Okay. Um, and are there safeguards in the law to prevent bad actors from trying to put other people on the list or are is it only the individuals can put themselves on the list? Only individuals can put themselves on the list and it has to be completely voluntary. There is language in each of the state laws that prohibits um, individuals from putting someone else on the list. I believe it's, I, I believe it's a misdemeanor to put someone on uh, the list without their consent, which 
you know, put it, even if someone was uh, saying, I want to be on the list and you put them on the list rather than putting themselves on the list, that would not be allowed because it has to be a completely voluntary process. And do you know if the 21 day period to get the, the period to get your firearm back once you have, or to be able to purchase, once you've um, requested to be taken off the list, can that overlap with a waiting period for purchase or is that a separate waiting period? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, it's a really good question. Um, uh, all I know is that the 21 day waiting period, at least in Virginia, has to, you, once they receive your form um, that you would like to be removed off the list, then it's 21 days from that period. Okay, great. Um, and are, th are there folks who, you know, as with most firearm policies, who are critics of this sort of law or, and, and what, what are their criticisms and how do you respond to them? Um, I think that some people see this law as a, a gateway type of law to people on the gun lobby, mm -hmm. see this as a, a gateway to pass, you know, what they consider more extreme. Um, you know, I worked at a gun violence prevention organization. I'm not trying to hide my views on this. <laughs> Um, but I, I think they see it as a gateway to a more extreme policy, but really I, I tend to think of it in a more hopeful way. And it has been introduced in a lot of red states and blue states as well. And I think the fact that Utah passed this law and it's in effect in Utah shows that, you know, it can be politically palatable to a, a wide variety of people. And maybe this is being naive, but I tend to think that if this law works well, then maybe people might start to think that other, you know, common sense gun laws could also work in their state. Yeah, it's a little hard to see what the opposition is to this one because it is voluntary. Um, do we have in, any data yet on how often this is used in Virginia and Washington and Utah? So I don't have super up-to-date data. Um, I'm looking at my numbers here. So in Virginia, it was used 13 times in the first four months. I've been told that I've been told that's about what uh, it was for the SRO, which is the extreme risk law in Virginia. Um, and then in Washington state, it was a, a bit more anemic. It was only used eight times in 10 months. And the trace did some really good reporting on this and found that a lot of the county clerk's office that they called and they called every county clerk's office in the state that uh, the county clerk's office didn't have the forms on hand, didn't know what they were supposed to do. So I would like to think that this isn't, um, it, it isn't that people don't wanna sign up for this or wouldn't wanna sign up for it if they know about it, but it's, it's an implementation issue. Um, it's an implementation issue because people don't know that it exists because we need people like healthcare providers, clinicians to be um, offering this as an option, not advocating for it because it's supposed to be voluntary, but offering this as an option. And we need, especially the people who are tasked with ensuring that the process goes smoothly to know about it. Yeah, and we saw this with ERPO laws too, that they, they weren't being used, not because they weren't useful, but because people didn't know about them so much. Exactly. Um, I have one last question for you. Do you, um, do you have any thoughts about in the federal bill, there's apparently a um, piece that allows for someone to bypass that 21 day waiting period to be off the list if they get a, um, I don't know, a certification or a declaration from a mental health professional saying that they're safe to have their firearm back? Yeah, I, I didn't include that because we're hoping to get that removed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's the best idea. I think that clinicians are overburdened as it is. I think that there's no reason that someone needs a gun within 24 hours. Um, and so asking a clinician to fill out paperwork to make sure that someone has a gun in 24 hours does not seem wise. It does not seem like a good use of resources. Um, I, I don't, I hope that is not included in the bill. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for all these great answers, Brian. It's so helpful to have you as a resource for all of this. And thanks to our audience for all the good questions.
And as our last order of business, we're just going to launch our closing poll really quick. And then we hope to see you all again next month. Okay, again, thank you everyone for being here and for your great questions for Brian. And Brian, thank you for sharing your personal experience and your expertise on this really interesting possibility. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, hope everyone has a great rest of their day.